40 years, of course, or 50 years, or whatever it is, as long as I've been preaching, there are little serendipity moments, you know, where God more than helps you, really, he just foresees. And it is interesting that, you know, it was two or three nights ago that I, I got very clearly God saying, you know, that, uh, um, that life is to be uh, letting Christ live in me moment by moment in a conscious way and of course then you can see that I got into that yesterday and lo and behold of course today's verse is just a commentary on it you know so it's one of those things that of course he knew it would you know 10 years ago or whenever we started Ephesians he knew we'd end up at this time on this verse it's Ephesians uh, five and you'll see the meaning of it in a moment I hope if I do a reasonable job of explaining it. James, uh, it's Ephesians 6, page one, page 10, 20, 1020. Uh, it's uh, Ephesians 6 and verse 6. Not in the way of eye service as men pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. And I hope you'll see it in a moment or two. Uh, w both of us would have been put off uh, a lot of Belfast religion, a lot of Northern Irish religion. And probably what uh, put us off, both of us, uh, was the, the brand of fundamentalism that existed in Belfast. It wasn't, in some ways, it wasn't as bad as the extreme fundamentalism in America. We were not preoccupied with abortion or all that kind of thing. It wasn't that. It seemed to us almost a, a learning how to uh, get John 3 and 16 over to people by rote. It seemed to us it was a, almost more an, a, a mental ascent. To a tra uh, as John Wesley said, you know, faith is not a train of ideas in the head, a mental ascent. It is a disposition of the heart. Uh, to us, fundamentalism seemed more like uh, a, a, a mental ascent, a train of ideas in the head. Believe the right thing and you'll be saved. Uh, for us, of course, it was especially uh, 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 expressed in uh, what what is uh, being a Christian? It's being good living, be good living. Uh, you don't go to the movies, don't dance, don't drink, don't smoke. You know, and so that was it in its kind of crudest form. But often that's what came over to you uh, uh, in in a lot of Belfast outdoor preaching. Though I have, of course, myself preached outdoors in Belfast quite often. But a lot of the fundamentalist preaching came over as that. But, but there were some good things, <laughs> some really good things. And we know many older men and women whom we respect greatly who would, have, who would be called fundamentalists and would have think of themselves as fundamentalists, but they weren't what I've described, you know. And they and the young men and women who listened to them had a phrase which in a way also kind of put us off. But when you think of it, it was dead on. Some of them would say, are you good living? Which you did not like, you know. Do you go to the movies? Do you da 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 da? But the other one was, have you a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? A few are personal, really. Now, it probably would have put us off at one time because we'd have, we would have had identified it with the other stuff. But it was dead on. Have you a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? And that is right. That is the issue. And that's what I tried to share with you at prayer yesterday. And it's what I'd share t today. Have you a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? And of course, what came to me was, it says in a very plain, simple way that you are meant to have now 
presently, today, day by day, a, rela a personal relationship with Jesus. You are meant to have a friendship with Jesus. You and he are meant to walk like that, day by day. And in some ways, it brings it home to you a, a little more than some of our own phrases, you know. Because it is exactly right. Do you have now, at this moment, a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? And of course, if I said to, to if you, you said to me, do you have a personal relationship with Marin at this moment? I did say, no, I don't. I mean, he's, I do have a friendship with him, I, but I haven't a personal relationship at this moment. He's not here. I can't have a personal relationship. I can have a, a, a Skype relationship with him, a phone relationship, but not a personal relationship in that we are at this moment interacting with each other. And I think that's the issue. That that's why each of us is here on earth. And that's the purpose of everybody's life. That they would have an interacting relationship with Christ, moment by moment, day by day, so that he himself is able to live the unique life that God planned for you and me to have. Of course, it would change utterly the life of, well, of course, in thinking of the lowest of the low, I, of course, can think of the ladies in that I think still brush some of, sweep some of the streets in the large cities in Asia. But I happen to think myself of the worst thing that I can remember uh, from Belfast days, and those were those wretched public toilets that were such a dreadful smell. And I would think, what would it be like to be a, a cleaner in one of those? And I mean, I could hardly bear the thought, but I couldn't resist from putting myself in their shoes and thinking, what would it be like to live in that wretched atmosphere with that dreadful smell and all those things going on around you every hour of the day? And that's why I refer to one of those people. What a difference it would make to a cleaner in one of those toilets if he really knew that his maker had planned for his son to live inside him and do that job. I think it would change, change your whole attitude, change your whole heart, change your whole idea of your life. And I think that's what God has planned for us. That's why each of us is here. Each of us is here to do something, or rather for Jesus to do something in us that he is not going to do in anybody else. Now, if you think thoroughly through the whole issue, you know, of God making us inside his son, and so many of us seeming to be the same, and yet none of us are the same as the other. If you think through all that whole thing, and then you come up with the question, you know, well, why, why does he make so many of us all different? Is he just bored when he makes two the same? Why does he do it? Well, you know, if you let your mind work logically, you, you're bound to come up with that. It must be because he can show himself, some facet of himself, in each of us that he has not shown in anybody else. And he is going to do something through each of us 
that he is not doing in anybody else. And that that is why we are all different. And that's the purpose of our lives. I think it would just transform uh, the lives of millions of dear hearts. Just think for a moment, you know, of those people that uh, Teresa uh, uh, served, you know, the poorest of the poor in India. And think of each one of them. And that every one of them is different from everybody else in the whole universe. And that's because his son is destined to do something through them that he will not do through anybody else. Of course, it gets rid of the whole celebrity problem, you know, because the reason we're preoccupied with celebrity is we want to be noticed, we want to be noticed. We want someone to see that we're different. And so, of course, it brings complete contentment and rest to that. But the heart of it is that each of us would day by day let Christ do in us what he has planned. And if you say to me, why is life dry or cold at times? Oh, obviously, obviously because we take our eyes <coughs> off the ball. We take our eyes off that reality and we start comparing ourselves, stupid people that we are, you know, be conformed to the image of this world. We start comparing ourselves with other people and with what they have achieved and what they have done. And you're bound to come up with disappointment there because that's not why you were here. You were put here to do something that nobody else can do. You were put here for Christ to achieve in you and to be in you what he will not be in anybody else. And if God has you here to do a special job, who cares what all the others think of you not doing their job? And so it transforms the whole attitude, you know. But the heart of it is that we would be living moment by moment with Jesus. And we would be letting him live in us every moment. I don't know how. I'm probably the only miserable creature here who uh, has had such experience of depression or can so easily fall into it. But I, I bet you also can. But uh, do you know why it is? Because we, for a moment, sink into the lie that we're on our own. We suddenly think, this is all we've got. And the reality is that every moment <laughs> there is the Son of the Most High God inside you. Every moment he's inside you. Every moment he's Tapping on the shoulder, um, I'd like to, to do this now. And we are instead buried down here in the midst of ourselves, thinking of ourselves as being alone. And here is the King of Kings right beside us, trying to get us to look up. And of course, it saves. The point is, it's the th the, all you need is a thought of reality. All you need is to think that for a moment. To think, wait a minute, Lord Jesus, this is your life. This, what are we going to do now? All you need to do is look up at reality for a second. And all that vast desolation disappears. But it means living moment by moment with him. And treating him as for really being in you as he is in a way that he is in nobody else. And above all, not thinking in terms of, oh yes, I have to let Christ live through me. Yeah, yeah, well, now, let, what did Christ do? Oh yes, well, he healed the lepers. Oh yes, well, he was patient in, in, in times of difficulty. Oh yes, well, he was courageous. That's what I have to do, I have to be. And immediately, you know, we sink back into ourselves, trying to imitate the one who is right inside us saying, uh, 
uh, I'd like to speak to you. Excuse me, I'd like to speak to you. Really a bit, I suppose, like old Tavia. Would it spoil some vast eternal plan? <laughs> a very personal kind of attitude, you know, to the Lord and Saviour who was there. And of course, what is resulting, and that's, you know, that's the little serendipity that I was telling you about. It results in Ephesians 6 and verse 6. It transforms all your relationships with each other here in this room and with everybody that you meet. It enables you to be a servant, as he says, slaves, be obedient to those who are your earthly masters. It enables you to be what you're supposed to be here on the earth, but in a different way. Not in the way of eye service. Uh, ophthalmos dulia. It's a, it's a compound Greek word. Ophthalmos obviously is eye, you can see. And dulia uh, or doulos is a slave. So it's really not in the way of eye slavery. And of course, that's what preoccupies us when we're trying to be a good salesperson or we're trying even to be a good friend or a good neighbor or a good brother or a good sister. We're eye slaves. Does Marty, does he agree with this? Uh, is he with me at this moment? Peggy, what is she thinking? Irene, uh, is she for this or is she against it? And of course it, first thing is, it makes you almost incapable of contributing anything to the other person because you're engaged in getting eye surface, finding out what are they thinking? What do they think about this? And so you're preoccupied with them and you're influenced by what their eyes are saying to you. So in a strange way, you couldn't hear Jesus if he shouted at you. You're not listening to him at that moment. And so in that way, you're not actually giving out any richness from him to the other person. It's a bit like uh, Lewis's comment on prayer. The moment you think, do I feel the presence of God? That moment, he says, you can no longer feel it because you're preoccupied with yourself and you're not worshipping God. And so you can't do both things together. It's a bit like the quantum problem because pro part of the problem of quantum physics is this business of do you change the circumstance by your very observation of it? And in a way, that's what we're doing with the eye surface. We're actually ceasing to serve them in any way, and most of all, of course, we're not serving our Lord. We're preoccupied with uh, their eyes and what they're thinking. And that's why he says, if you're listening and walking with Jesus moment by moment, and you're receiving from him second by second, what he wants to do through you in this life, then that is a rich content that is that you're beginning to transmit and express even in the very atmosphere. And in that sense, you're filling the world with something of God's will. As opposed to the eye service where you're preoccupied with saying, what effect has my words had on this person? What effect is my service having on them? 
-hmm. And so it's a completely different life. And he's saying, do what you've been given to do in the world, but not in the way the world does. Not preoccupied with what the world thinks of what you're doing, but preoccupied with the person within you who has something to do through you that only you can do. So not in the way of eye service. And then, of course, the next one just follows so easily as men pleasers. And this anthropop, areskoi, is, the, is another compound word. And it literally means people who are preoccupied with pleasing men. And of course, that's, that's what happens so quickly. Indeed, we would say to each other, well, listen, if people don't like you, you can't influence them. If the other person doesn't like you, uh, they won't listen to you. So, of course, you have to be pleasant to them. Well, yeah, yeah. But we don't end up like that. We end up, we want their approval. It's so funny. It turns service into mastery or bossing or lordship, you know, because you want to serve them, but really you're preoccupied with pleasing them. So you want to please them and you want to increase and improve your own reputation because you like people to like you. And so the concentration goes back on yourself in men-pleasing. It is a preoccupation with what do they think of you? Are they pleased with you? Are these people that you can call your friend that might help you when you need help? And so the whole concentration which starts off a service becomes really a service to yourself. So, of course, there is a way from it, a way of escape. And that is to live with Jesus moment by moment, to let him live in you, to let him live in you, to be preoccupied with him living in you and doing what he wants to do through you. I don't know the what you find with speaking uh, in public, uh, speaking uh, to a group of people. But of course, my agony in the earliest days, I, I remember one of the early days when your parents and you, I think, came to hear me preach in some little church uh, somewhere. And I remember the big issue, and this is what I practiced with my dad. My dad would listen to some of my sermons, uh, first of all. And I would pre, uh, practice concentrating on what I had planned to say and not being preoccupied with what they were all thinking or with all of them out there. And of course, in the early days, the only way I could do it was to cut them off, you know, just forget that they're there and concentrate as if I was just delivering this to just my dad or my dog but that it, the whole concentration was on what I was saying. And that was the difficulty. It was the problem of speaking to people and really speaking to them and keeping the train of ideas in your head clear and yet actually speaking to them and being interested in them. And that's the difficulty. The difficulty is of communicating in some way to an external world while the internal world is the, is the most real one to you, is the one that, that guides your thoughts. And that's the whole issue. The issue is, are you able to do what Jesus is in you to do if you are preoccupied with the other people and preoccupied either with pleasing them or seeing what they're thinking? And that's the... That's the battle. The battle is to speak from a quiet heart that refuses to be influenced by the outside and will continue to say what it thinks is right, even if the others are all opposing you. And it's the same, actually, in sales. It's the same situation. Because the moment you become preoccupied with what their attitude is, you are 
pretty well finished yourself because you can no longer gather your own thoughts together in a comprehensive and convincing way. And so the heart of good salesmanship is having your own set of truths that you want to share and being able to share those in an attractive way without being distracted by their possibly negative response to them. And of course that works. And in some ways, <laughs> oh, I character like Gingrich actually is expert at it because he's so full of what he's saying and he can fight against the wave that is coming from outside. So that, that's the difference uh, in service that takes place when Christ is a part. And of course it goes on. But as servants of Christ, so even if you're slaves, be good slaves but not as slaves to masters, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. And that's, that's why we're here. We're here so that Christ can fill our hearts with his peace. Let the peace of Christ rule your hearts so that he can fill our hearts with his peace. And from that heart, we do what he wants to do through us so that there's a, a continual stream from the innermost part of our hearts to the outward activity of our hands or our tongues. And so we do the will of God from our hearts so that it's from a pure heart, so that out of the fullness of the heart the mouth speaketh, so that there's a continuous stream of the life of Christ that comes from the deepest part of our beings. And it seems to me that's the deepest, the deepest effect of letting Christ live in us. That the, the innermost part of your being, Christ is there. And that certainly was what just set me back on my heels, you know, when Bob Trosen first and other, uh, the other authors that we re read first talked about a clean heart. I just assumed you couldn't have a clean heart. You couldn't have a mind that was filled with just pure thoughts. And then, of course, I saw you've got nothing if you haven't that. If you haven't that, you're in battle all day long. You're battling all these things within fears within and worries and anxieties and I suppose pride and envy and jealousy as well but particularly those anxieties and that sense of apprehension that you can feel in your heart and of course the dear world of Christendom has condemned itself to dreadful failure and defeat because it thinks that's normal life. And of course, you're finished if you think that's normal life because you never win with it. It grows deeper and deeper and more and more subtle inside you and you find cleverer and cleverer ways of keeping this dreadful garbage inside and not letting anybody else see it until that becomes your whole life. So, of course, the heart of letting Christ live in you is that he lives in the deepest part of your being. In other words, there is no unclean thing that you touch. That your heart is something that can be projected on a screen of an outdoor movie theater and let everybody see it and you wouldn't be ashamed because Christ alone is there. So... I do think it's a higher life, you know, that we talk about 
when we really talk about real Christianity, that it is Jesus himself living in you a life that he has not lived in anybody else and will not, never live in anybody else. And our great privilege is to let that happen within us. Let's pray.